As an artist, I'm really interested in knowledge and data and what that means uh, today and what that will possibly mean in the future and where knowledge and where discipline is developing and growing. My questions as an artist was really what is happening to data and knowledge and a lot of these antiquarian books and texts and artefacts are now being digitised and people are now globally able to access this, this information. So they'll scroll through a Leonardo da Vinci manuscript that's uploaded at the British Library, or look at some hieroglyphics that are on display online via the British Museum. But then what happens to that artefact? What is the value of that original artefact if everyone is, is engaging with this digitally? And it crossed my mind that actually these artefacts are full of other data, scientific data, that could bear some knowledge and a glimmer of the past. In terms of science and art, I became interested in that probably about 10 years ago um, now. So I contacted Sarah because she was doing something very similar to what I was doing. So we collaborated on a number of sort of projects in the past and then this um, project which started with Sarah's discovery of a copy of Ovid's Metamorphosis in a junk shop sort of came out of that, came out, out of our collaboration together and expanded from that. Working in the intersection of art and science and being very interested in that transition that occurred from art to science, so material science has moved away from what was the artistic domain for example, how could we sum up all of this investigative practice and, and sort of rethinking about the value of the artefact using a single copy, which was Ovid's Metamorphosis, which was a, seemed a perfect analogy for this kind of uh, inquiry, because in itself, it, the text itself is about transformation and change. Um, there's some beautiful tales of gods changing into people or changing into animals uh, or changing into flowers. and itself has been reinterpreted through the ages, through culture, and has been borrowed from for science in terms of naming species or naming scientific processes. So this is a very culturally weighty book to be able to work with, which felt perfect for the project. This is a, a Duran bottle of molten agar that's just come out of the autoclave. Um, the autoclave is basically a, a sort of giant pressure cooker that um, takes the temperature up to 121 degrees centigrade um, at a pressure of 15 pounds per square inch for 20 minutes and that sterilizes the, the agar and means that there's no sort of bacteria or molds or anything in there and the agar itself is basically um, bits of meat extract um, that are food for the bacteria some yeast extract that's food for the bacteria and then there's a gelling agent called agar um, in there and at the moment the agar is molten so it's a liquid but when it cools down it will set into a solid um, gel. So to make it even more nutritious for bacteria on the book that are probably old and quite damaged, we add um, sheep's blood, which is this um, here. So I'm just going to take the lid off here, take the lid off here, and then we pour the sheep's blood um, into the agar. I've worked with quite a few artists, and artists are all different as our sort of scientists. So I think there's a there's a spectrum of scientists and a spectrum of artists and some of the artists I work with use the sort of science and sort of take it away and the scientist becomes like a, a service to the, to the artist which as a scientist I don't find very rewarding I mean the, the work that comes out of it might be quite nice but it's I don't feel I've been a, been a part of it but other projects including this sort of project I'm working with with Sarah become a sort of true collaboration where sort of the scientists and the artists sort of throw ideas around and they back them backwards and forwards and you end up in a place that you never thought you'd end up so it, it can give rise to sort of very unexpected outcomes. It's hidden data that you don't readily see and the only way we can see that is by applying these scientific processes or, or uncovering the bacteria or the microbial life by using the nutrient agar to uncover or to reveal the unseen. We're making work from these prints <clears throat> and I, I suppose we're constantly thinking about what the scientific output is and what the artistic output is so at each stage we're kind of recognising sort of artistic, cultural, contextual value and then also um, continuing the scientific process to try and achieve more knowledge and more data. After we had 
printed the pages, the next step was to identify them. And so uh, Simon isolated, he chose the bacteria from the pages. And then the next phase after that was to streak them, mm -hmm. which is where Simon has a normal Petri dish and he samples from the bioassay dish and uh, streaks them out on the Petri dish. Um, yeah. it, the process is called streak dilution, so it's a way of purifying to the bacteria. So you take a single colony um, with a loop, and then you spread the loop onto the agar, and then you dilute the streak around the plate, so that somewhere on that plate you'll end up with a single colony, which is one of these round things here. And then you know that that single colony is an individual species of, of bacteria. If we had a mix of these bacteria, it would be very difficult to identify them because each bacterium would have a different sort of characteristic that would blur all the tests that we can do on them. I think they, they were the bits that I was interested in, wasn't it? Because I was interested in the colonies that had kind of clearly merged and were creating these bacterial soups, but Simon kept on having to say, no, it would be impossible to, <laughs> to isolate those. When it grows, it divides by something called binary fission, so a, a single cell will grow to a certain length and then it will split into two cells and those two cells will split into 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. But every time it does that, although it copies the DNA very accurately, it's never an exact copy of what it was before. So there is, within that sort of genome, there is the capacity for, for mutation and that makes bacteria so ad adaptive that they can sort of mutate very, very quickly to, to adapt to new challenges. And of course with the tales of transformation where gods turn into cows, bulls, rams, all, all of that sort of, it, it feels very rich, uh, the tales and the scientific process. There's lots of potential there for some more work. Where you've got an artist and a scientist working properly together, you get sort of an, an interplay and exchange of ideas um, and you gain sort of different ways of looking at things and occasionally something sort of unexpected comes up. Um, so a, a result that you didn't expect um, and it's when you chase those results up you can find yourself in, in very unexpected places that sometimes, not all of the times, that can lead to new scientific discovery. Both scientists and artists tend to be quite creative people and we sort of adopt the same process I guess. So if the experiment works properly then you sort of demonstrate that you're idea was in fact sort of correct but there's a huge amount of failure in there so you do lots of experiments that have sort of negative results but then you go back look at those negative results and you sort of critically look at them and then you design sort of further experiments and I see some artistic practice is, is exactly the same as that it's sort of having ideas putting things into action some things working other things sort of not working and sort of coming to a, a final end point the overarching process is the same. So we have a question, a research question that we want to answer or an interest and we explore it with process. What I would say is that after that, that's where there is a divergence in approach. And we will investigate, we will do experiments, we, you know, you, you both, I do experiments in the studio, Simon does experiments in the lab, um, but what I would say is that the, the approach to the subject from a science perspective, I would assert was a reductive one. So they refine their questions further and further and get into more and more detail, whereas the art approach, the artistic approach, is that the overall context is still given consideration. So what's the relationship? How is this affecting politics, the society, the viewer, the audience? It's a much more external way of thinking when you're creating work. Whereas the science, scientific process, I would say, is a much more in, internal way of thinking um, and more about refining and accessing knowledge and truth. If I want to make something up in a creative way, and I always use the analogy like science fiction proposes new science in th through literature or through film, um, that always makes Simon very uncomfortable. As far as he's concerned as a scientist, we cannot claim or propose anything that isn't true to what we're doing or his perception of truth to what we're doing. So that has 
created some interesting debate. As an artist, I feel like I'm there not just to explore the journey, the creative journey that we're on, but also to, to critique why and how we're doing it within a broader social context. One of the things that Simon and I discovered when we were doing this process, we were exploring how the book had been made and how it was fabricated in Paternoster Row, uh, the founders who had designed the text, and the process that, that was used to print the book was uh, the letterpress printing. And as we were um, doing our own form of printing with these bacterial prints, we were laying the page down and we noticed that the agar had cast the text. So when you hold this up to the light, you can see the text in the agar surface. Conceptually, as an artist, I'm quite interested in whether we can you know, do something in the future with the text that's there on the surface of the agar and the, where the, the, the bacteria have landed. One of the things that has been interesting for me when I've been looking at the pages after I've been documenting is that there is much more bacteria on the places where the Latin is. And I've, it's kind of made me ask, wonder whether Latin is something that would, people would have struggled with, if, especially if they're not educated at the time in the 1700s. So are they engaging with that bit of the text more because they're trying to get to grips with it? Um, I don't know, but there's definitely correlation with book use and the presence of, of bacteria. So I'm always very conscious that as a scientist or someone using a microscope, it's a very reductive view looking down the microscope. And I'm interested in what the entire sample and the entire context looks like as the artist. So the final prints will be um, about one metre and one metre 20 across, uh, showing the full microbiology map of each page as it's grown. Um, to make the prints, uh, the, it's four layers within the image. You have the original agar plate. Uh, I then do a high-res scan of the page. And thankfully, I can, because I can see where the page was located on the original agar, I can actually work out where to put the final scan on top, so I know it is a perfect match. And then I isolate the bacteria digitally by cutting out, it takes days, <laughs> cutting out all of the uh, bacterial colonies so that they're on a transparency and then I can overlay them over the top. So I documented each plate. This is what the first plate now well, originally looked like after two weeks. Um, I did two photos um, of the plate. I did one that was backlit on a light pad, um, which highlights the hemolysis that's occurring. Uh, within the bacterial colonies, which is where the bacteria is eating the red blood cells. And then I also shot it without the light pad as well. And then those two images are merged into the final shot. The long-term vision is that as we open the book, this whole world uh, unfolds, that the book actually, that, you know, the data that the book actually holds is not just the text on its pages, but all of the scientific information that it has carried and, and amassed over the last 300 years. In, it's a bit like, you know, you hear in tales where people have written using invisible ink. Essentially, this data is invisible, and so we're trying to reveal that. in a manner that reflected how disciplines have been presented in science museums. So like genetic modification is shown at the science museum in a specific way. And I was imagining what biological hermeneutics would look like, say after 300 years, what its display would look like at this point in time. So this display at Central St. Martins covers both the methodologies that Simon and I have discovered or, or developed. It displays the archive that we're creating and it also displays the results. And I don't know whether the results are art or science yet, that's yet to be determined, but they are in the manner of the prints and the maps of the microbiology that's grown on the surface of the text. And because the whole concept of the exhibition was that we were presenting a trans discipline, so a, so a new discipline or a discipline beyond disciplinary boundaries, I've presented a speculative approach to what a discipline would look like if it had been existing for many years. 
And so a discipline always has an archive. So this is our transdisciplinary archive here of the bacteria that Simon isolated from the bacterial prints. And then here are the bacterial prints that we made of 29 pages of Ovid's Metamorphosis. So we worked on a specific chapter of the book. I wanted to translate that in microbiological information, microbial information. And this is followed again by another couple of prints uh, showing the microbiological mapping that we've developed during the project. The great thing about the Art and Science MA has is reinvigorated my confidence in the art side of the partnership because I've been working with an art historian, Charlotte Slay, and a microbiologist, Dr. Simon Park. You constantly, well, I constantly feel inadequate almost in those partnerships because that's not my area of expertise. But by doing the Art and Science MA, it's rekindled my um, assertion and my my affirmation, I suppose, of what my expertise is. It's rekindled my assurance that actually art is the area of expertise and that I match that of the history and of the science. The broader lens on the project is how do we create a successful working environment to enable art and science collaborations which in effect could create change and innovation.